acknowledge and pay respects to all Nurukai, past and present. Acknowledge all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here tonight and acknowledge all other people who have joined us here. Yada, Gayagu, Dakanung Nira. Welcome to Dakanung Country. Hello, welcome to this very special episode of the Litmus Test. Tonight it's all about Indigenous art. We've got a great panel lined up for you, great discussion and a great local legend. But to kick things off, we're going to start with a song from Jamie Smith. Take it away, Jamie. at the end of the show to do another song for us but let's introduce our panel let's get on with it um, to my left here we have Jody Dima who is the owner of the booty gallery uh, which specializes in indigenous artworks um, we have Kylie Cassidy who provided all this art that we can see behind us a local indigenous artist and you're from the 
Uh, Wiradjuri tribe. Yes. yes? Right. Ron Smith yes. is a contemporary artist from the Kamilaroi country and works with local schools uh, on Aboriginal art projects. Yes. And to my right here, Gary Purchase is an artist and descendant of the Dungadi people of the Kempsey region of New South Wales. Hello all. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, first off, before we get into things, you all have brought a random relic, a little item with you. So I'll start with you, Jodie. What have you brought to show us? Well, I thought the way of introduction would be to bring a Yotha Yindi CD. And the reason that that is relevant um, to how I ended up as a gallerist and, and having a, an Aboriginal art gallery was that I worked with the Midnight Oil office in the Midnight Oil office for a little while back in my mid-twenties. And they were heavily involved in Indigenous issues and challenges for Indigenous people at the time. So a lot of um, activists came through the office and Yothi Yindi and a number of other Aboriginal bands did as well. And I suddenly realised that I really didn't know very much about Aboriginal people, although I thought I did. And so it was an introduction uh, through music that helped me uh, move into the, the art arena because I'd been an art student, but I didn't really understand very much about Aboriginal art. So it was through music. And, and of that course began your interest in all of it, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, and, and of course music and art in, in an Aboriginal culture can't, can't really be torn apart. They, they, they fit together as such. Mm. So that was my little piece of interest. Um, yes, yeah. uh, Kylie, what have you got to show us? Um, well, you've got I'll all of this, about, I think. Yeah, I'll talk about this one here in particular. Um, this, uh, the idea behind this, I was approached by the Gosford Hospital and asked to do some works for the birthing unit at the hospital. And being a mum of four, I sort of just thought about, I don't know, my cultural ties and links to the land and motherhood and the birthing experience. And yeah, as I guess as Aboriginal people, and we say we are the land or we're born from this land, I sort of took that concept, but then with the idea of having a water birth, and so she is the water, and yeah, the water is her, and she's rising from the water and having her pregnancy. I've filled her body with our, our dreaming symbols, um, symbols that represent water, um, yeah, and some of those dot work and line works. Use the white in the, the armbands and that, which represents your spirituality, and yeah, so that's it. Mm, great. <laughs> Beautiful. Ron, what have you got to show us to talk about? I brought a shell. <laughs> a shell? Yes. On my travels across overseas, I'd travelled through India and such, mm -hmm. and it was quite interesting to find out I'd gone into places where I've discovered how Australia broke away, India broke away from Australia, I suppose, because I saw full bloods there, who I thought were full bloods, but they were Indian, of mm. course. And I became very involved, and when I returned, I decided to take up art. That got you into art, the, the thought of that? Yes. I like the whole concept of the spiral and I oh thought, right. well, my life is spiralling somewhere so I can... I guess we're all spiralling yes. somewhere. <laughs> I hope I can spiral in, in the right direction. Yes, thank you. Uh, Gary, have you got something to show us? I do, and it's uh, a little bit different to everyone else. I have a pair of Darth Vader shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, can we see oh, those? We've got a shot I don't know if you can see those, but... Um, <laughs> I grew up as a massive, massive Star Wars fan, and um, basically the, the stylings of Ralph Macquarie, who did a lot of the art for uh, George Lucas, that just the colours and the stuff that he does, like just uh, the concepts that he uses, and that just really piqued my interest at a young age, so just learning uh, composition and colour. And that, that kind of got you into art? It did. It, yeah, okay. It did, just, you know, just the way that he composed things and... You know, it's the way his brain worked and all that sort of stuff. It's just the, the things that came out of his mind. Just, mm. you know, a lot of my work sort of pushes a little further away from traditional stuff with a lot more abstract and contemporary sort of themes and ideas. And a lot of it comes from you know, sort of thinking outside the square. Which is well, that, that, that's a good premise because a lot, you know, inspiration can come from anywhere. Mm. And, you know, uh, yeah. we're, we're talking tonight specifically about Indigenous art and the culture, but... Uh, Everyone has a culture, and uh, we're all dealing with cross-cultural situations. Well, as you say, you're borrowing from lots of different cultures. I'd like to take my influence from anything that I see. Mm. Yeah, I'm the same with my art. My, any surroundings or a story I might get told, and then I interpret it in my own way. And it's very far from what you would call traditional art or what's been seen as traditional art. And even in those times, those traditional artists are painting in a contemporary <laughs> style. It's contemporary for that, mm. that era. So, yeah, art styles 
all over, not just the Indigenous, are forever changing. It's never dormant and it's never one story or one style that stays the same. So. Um, before we get heavily into our discussion, mm -hmm. we've got a little package that we'll run which talks about these sort of topics and more. So let's run that package now and then we'll get seriously into our panel discussion. Spanish, German, and I'm also an Indigenous person to Australia. So it's on my mother's side, and I'm a proud Wanneroo woman from uh, Hunter Valley. On my father's side, I am Italian, Croatian, and Slovenian from my dad's father, and um, my grandma is English, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, and my mum is Aboriginal from the Gamilaroi and Bigambul nations of northwest New South Wales and southwest Queensland. Uh, I'm a Wiradjuri woman from the central west New South Wales. I was born in Orange and I've got family connections right across the central west region from my grandfather's country which is Condobolin and my grandmother was born at Wellington and mum grew up in Gilgandra so yeah still got family all out there and, re and visit when we can and I grew up here on the central coast so I live now in Darkenham country and my children here on Darkenham country I've been here since I was six years old. And how does it connect you to your heritage? Um, well at Nasda because we learn traditional and um, contemporary dancing it's another way of me to express myself in an indigenous art form um, also through um, kind of fusion so indigenous with contemporary it's um, an extra way of me to express myself through dance that a lot of other um, people or Indigenous people don't have the chance to do sometimes. Dance as an art form, I guess you can say, um, started in Australia with Aboriginal dance. Um, as an Indigenous person, it just, it feels so right when we do dance, especially when we learn traditional dances. Um, it's like having that part of you that, I guess, was always meant to be there yeah. and kind of, you know, filling in a little hole. Yeah. Art itself and Aboriginal art, when we think of our story and our song and our art, um, they're always part of our, our land, but they're our, our first ways of telling story. We didn't have pen and paper or writing and things like that. They are our, our storybooks and our teachers and, you know, that's the way that we've communicated and language. Language is a massive part of that as well. So for me, I guess it's... It's that connection to my heritage and being able to still tell stories and be a, st a storyteller in a contemporary society or contemporary way. And how can we support young Indigenous people to get involved in dance? Um, I think there needs to be um, probably more promotion out there of what is available um, because NASDA is a phenomenal learning institution and not um, not enough people know about it, I think, and a lot of Indigenous kids would love to come here and would benefit greatly. Even if, you know, they don't necessarily want to be a professional dancer, you still learn so much about yourself and your identity by coming here. Supporting young Indigenous people into dance, art and culture, I think, is about us as a community just encourage them to take whatever opportunity that is available and not just to sit back and think oh should I have a go I, I should have done that because you will regret it later and I've done it myself over the years like you didn't take that opportunity or you didn't get yourself out there um, and then you you sort of you miss the boat a bit and you think oh I could have done that I really could have so you doubt yourself there's a lot of self-doubt so just I guess encouraging them to be strong in their their um, self-confidence and their belief in themselves and and also in their identity too I think that plays a big part if they're strong in their culture and their identity they they'll be more confident or have more self-esteem in, in having a go at something like that all right we're back um, so now let, let's actually start talking about indigenous art so let me let me start with you Kylie how did you get into this? How did you get become an artist? How did you start um, creating all mainly this? Mainly from family, like growing up, I, I grew up here on the central coast from, from the time I was six, I've lived here on the coast. 
but we'd always travel home and visit Condoblin, Gilgandra, um, Orange. I was born in Orange and, and I'd go home and you know there'd be aunties in condo silk screening Aboriginal artworks onto silk scarves to sell in Sydney markets and um, you know uncles making didgeridoos going out and collecting them and skinning them and burning them back and stuff like that wood carving into them or burning or painting into them so art was always around me growing up my uncle um, was a, a poet he he was um, great with the pencil drawing figures like it that would look realistic and so I was just always surrounded by it. I had another uncle who was a great leather craftsman and a wood craftsman so we've got some of those pieces throughout our family now and um, so they're doing all different forms and yeah, what drew you to painting just, in particular? Um, I guess my, my uncle that also drew, he was a painter as well and my nan used to have some of his paintings in, in her home and I just got inspired by that. I also had another cousin in Orange who was heavily into um, acrylic artworks and, and using bright colours and it was the first time I'd sort of seen around the age of 12, 13 Aboriginal art in bright colours. Like she just used blues and greens and colours that you wouldn't normally see because everyone thinks of Aboriginal art as those traditional earthy colours. Mm. Um, so yeah, I just, from 13, I started drawing and painting of my own. My nan's still got my original artworks and um, I'm 33 this year. So yeah, from 13 onwards I've painted. So yeah, and it's been forever changing. I've had a, um, some time over the years where I have studied as well. I've done Aboriginal art at TAFE um, and I've studied under Madeline Anderson, who's an well, artist from the teach Daily at River. Though? Yeah, years ago they had a, and that's where I met Ron. We had an art group at TAFE. Yeah, I was 18 at the time when I started studying. So yeah, and it's just grown from there. And with the work that I went into, youth work, I'd always use art as a tool to engage the youth. So it's just stayed with me, the art. Yeah. Okay, Ron, since we brought you into the discussion, <laughs> how did you get into this? How did you start <laughs> with all of this, apart from it's, the shell itself? It's apart from the shell. I think a lot has to do with my brother, Keith, my older brother, Keith. He was an exceptionally talented egg carver. Egg carver? Yes. <laughs> Emu eggs. Emu eggs. Oh, okay. oh, he was brilliant at it. And I always thought, gee, I wish I could do something like that. And I was married, went away, travelled overseas, got divorced and all that. No, I travelled overseas and I came back and I thought, I might give this art a try. And when I went there, I was rather impressed. I was taught by Madeline Anderson, met a great bunch of people, and it was just fun to be around. And I thought, I wouldn't mind expanding a little bit further on this thing. I'll see how far I can go. So I did a university course, but I didn't quite pass because I found the epistemology of Western art just didn't suit mm -hmm. my philosophy on what I should be doing in an art piece. So I thought, no, oh, I will continue on. And I try to juxtapose quite a lot. I'm fascinated with Jackson Pollock. I like his philosophy of there is no start, there is no end. And being an uninitiated Aboriginal, I find that I can't tell stories or stuff, but I can still juxtapose my his art with symbolic to a totemic symbolism mm -hmm. from Aboriginal art. So I try to use that. So again, you're taking these influences from Influence. other places? Oh yes, you have yeah. to take them you know, otherwise. Because I couldn't sit there being an uninitiated man, I could not paint stories or such. Right. So I found that found if, I, your own way. Hmm, I found if I could try something else. Right. Try to get people's try to get people's ideology away from where they look at Aboriginal art and they think, it has to, where's the story? Where is this? Where is that? And you think, no, it doesn't have to be that. So moving away from that traditional try, sense of yes. it, yeah? I mean, you're the same, Gary. I mean, uh, you, you made a deliberate choice not to really do the traditional approach. Well, yeah? you know, f for me personally, like I grew up in the in the suburbs. You know, I grew up you know, ten minutes ten minutes away from the CBD of Sydney. So for me to to paint in the traditional style, it's it's not right for me. You know, I, for me, I tend to take too much influence from everywhere else. I don't like to be pigeonholed in one in one little sort of box. You know, I'd, I'd like to take in what sort of sense of traditional Aboriginal art, but push it in directions that it's not used to going in. You know, add a little bit of abstract to it, push it with different colours, push it with different ideas and modern themes and, you know, just push it in ways that it's never never really meant to be pushed. Mm. You know? Try the boundaries. Yeah. yeah. Jo Jody, I mean, as someone who's got a strong interest in digital art and you've got contacts with people who are in Northern Territory, for example, painting the more traditional way. How do you see the dichotomy going on here? 
Well, that's the interesting thing about Indigenous art that um, is not understood, I don't think, that there is a traditional art form, which is exactly what Ron's saying. It is used and, and, and painted and continued on by people who are initiated within their mob on country and are telling story handed down generation to generation. That's not the same with people who, for whatever reason, have been removed from their mob or disenfranchised or um, uh, for, for many different reasons had to move away from country and weren't in a position to have traditional stories passed down to them from their family. So therefore have their own stories to tell and are self-expressing, which is a wonderful thing to do, but it, it sits more in an urban type um, genre for art when we talk about if we have to put things in the boxes mm. I'm being extremely general here the idea that someone would self-express in the communities that I work with with the Arts Centre is far removed from what they do they don't self-express they do exactly what their mother or grandmother and their aunties and their nieces are doing because it's a handed down evolution a of a story. Yeah. a story. And you don't that change that story. Yes. You can't, two and two will always be four, it's never going to be seven. Yeah. So a story that's passed down will always remain the same. And someone might choose different colours to do it in, like some of the communities I work with use extremely bright colours. Mm. And you can see one artist's style from another but it's passed down. It's not a, a, an idea of self-expression coming from within. Well, this comes to, let me try to get a definition then. What is Indigenous art? Is it that passed down story or is it the fact that there's an Indigenous artist doing it? As simple as that. What defines Indigenous art? Well, uh, for me personally, I think it's, you know, it's fluid. It's constantly evolving and changing. Mm. Like the traditional styles that are out in country and all that, yes, that's Aboriginal art. <coughs> But for the, the vast majority of us, don't we've never experienced that. We've all been in ur urban environments, and you know, for us to express ourselves, it doesn't really involve that. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we live in a modern society, and you know, in the 21st century. Mm. You know, do you feel we still need to have that uh, traditional approach as well, though? Is that important for you to to, main, oh, to continue yeah, that? I think it's important, and definitely for those communities that are still pra practicing those traditions, and even for us, like we're not we're not saying that we're not um, storytellers. We're still storytellers, yeah. just in a, in another way, and we're yeah. still telling. You might have a traditional um, stories in, within your family, and just because you've grown up urban or you haven't lived on country and that doesn't mean you don't have those dreaming stories or whatever that you still paint it's just in a different way yeah. and as you said or you're using creating, colors that are not yeah, necessarily traditional or symbols or yeah just look at like, it from a different angle yeah that's yeah. it and like Jodie's saying it's not so much self-expression there but I tend to disagree I think it is because if they're choosing those different colors and even though it's that story it's in that that artist's individual expression of that story it is still so moving forward, yeah, it's not definitely. trapped in time. It's, it's not, no, I don't believe that it is. It, the story remains the same, it's the delivery that, yeah. Is well, as a writer, I can say the story is always yeah. the same, it's just how you tell it. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. And the story is the most important part, really, yeah. isn't it, when you're talking about it? And if you're still painting in that story, the story's got to go on forever. That's right, that's yeah. Right. And that's why that it practice will be of the passing on. length of time. What's it will still be there. Yeah. Everything, it's all in the delivery. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's so different to the, to the Western aspect, I think, of looking at things yeah. in that the artistic expressions that have been created in a lot of other cultures, not just Western, mm. are n not necessarily to do with telling a story. Something can be done simply to create something of beauty, yeah. but the underpinning, um, the, the cornerstones of Aboriginal culture our storytelling. Well, this, this That's is the distinction. Yes. This yeah. is my question. How important is it then um, for you to express yourselves credibly, telling those stories, having a connection to your culture and to your history through your art? Is that a major part of why you're an artist? I'll, I'll start yeah, with you. Yeah, definitely. For me, it is. I think I'd be lost without that if I didn't have some form, whether I was a singer or a dancer or whatever it might be, if I didn't have some form of my culture that I practice. I don't think I'd be strong in my identity or comfortable mm. in myself mm. or know who I was even. Mm. Yeah, and I feel yeah. that I see that a lot with 
young kids these days when they don't know who they are or they have no connection or identity mm. to country and that's why we do a lot of what we do in the schools and with young youth groups mm. and young people that it, yeah identify I'm Aboriginal but I have no idea where I come from or you know my mum doesn't know my grandma or where that's our right. people are from so we need that definitely that's, that's and I guess it's more thing. sense that um, because you very nearly lost touch with that history entirely yeah definitely. you know whereas yeah us white Europeans, you know, we've got this other history that we brought across. So you, you're trying to reconnect with this, I guess, a lot of you, yeah? yeah. Through your art. Yeah. And I'd say it's all, always been there. It's just that I think the wider Australia doesn't see it, mm. you know? Like, we've still got urban mobs that know language. You might not speak fluently, and some, some people do. There's still language, there's still song, there's still dance, and we still practice. You know, you can go anywhere across Sydney or New South Wales or whatever yeah. and see dance groups practicing traditional dances that have been passed down through family. Like our culture didn't die. It was just maybe suppressed for a little while or held off in a different well, way. Well, indeed, but as you yeah, saw in our package and our local legend around. coming up, NASDA yeah. are an important part of that, for example. Yeah, definitely. And Ron, you teach young people. So do you find that cultural connection is a major part of what you do? I certainly hope so. I'm trying to do it, but a lot of people seem to take this idea that you have to have this ideas of the story in that but to me it's not about it is about the story but I can't tell the story because I have a mother who is 100 years old very unusual for an uh, Aboriginal lady to hit that stage being a non-drinker or a non-smoker she's done exceptionally well but I she will not tell me stories oh. because she looks at me and I say mum what happened and she goes I lived it you don't have to it's mm. my life I've lived. Well, at that age, there may be some stories she'd rather not tell, perhaps. Yes. Mm. I think there would be quite a lot of stories mm. that she doesn't mm. want to... Mm. Because the marriage certificate, Raymond Smith, married, Aboriginal woman, no birth certificate, no nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's where I get confusion quite a lot. So that's why I love Jackson Pollock. It lets me allow to just express myself with the flow and the movement of throwing paint around. And <laughs> I feel a lot better for it. And, and Gary, you're, you, as you say, you've taken a different path. Do you I feel that that, um, that connection to country is still important? Look, to, to me it's massive. Well, like, I grew up pretty much the only Indigenous kid around where I was. You know, totally I used true. to get picked on every day and this, that, the other. It got to the point, you know, a lot of young black fellas, they just get sick of being black. They think, well, why, why do we keep getting mm. picked on for this, that, the other? And my father once said to me, he said, that's the one thing they can know and it can never take away from you. Mm. The, the one thing that, you, that you, 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 you know, you want to suppress is the one thing that can make you the most powerful. So to me, that was like a eureka moment. And I said, you know what? I'm part of something that's much, much bigger than me. It's mm. much, much bigger than anyone that's mm. around me. Mm. And you know, I'm bloody proud of it now too. Mm. So um, let me ask, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Jody. Uh, I want to ask what support you guys have received in preparing you. You were talking about your family er earlier, Kylie, and how that sort of got you into it. In your experience, Jodie, and working with many other artists, particularly in areas that may not get that kind of support, mentorship, family influence, um, is there enough for Indigenous people from Indigenous people to support that art? Well, there'll never be enough. <laughs> um, we're, we're still struggling to try and balance out the issues that we have between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. But I think the question that you asked before that was what is Indigenous art? Mm. And you had four different responses from four different people. <laughs> if there were 20 people, you get 20 different responses. Mm. Because like all things Indigenous, there's no homogenised what is an Aboriginal person. Does it matter? What is Aboriginal art? What does, is, you know, does it matter that we say Indigenous art at all, really, these days? Oh, it's of just course. I, I think it's incredibly important to identify Indigenous art because it's special. It needs to be identified. So how do we nurture that then? The art centres which I, that I work with are supported through various government art schemes. They're cooperatives. By default, they have to be on Aboriginal land. They're, they're cooperatives in the sense of what a cooperative is, owned by those people, run and managed by a board of Aboriginal people, and they have various levels of, of government support. And that's a good model that, that is um, supported and developed and set up by Aboriginal people. The first um, Aboriginal art centre was the Papunya Tula Artists 
where the dot painting movement started mm. and they came up with the concept of how they wanted to manage their community and their art and their assets and that model has, has, is still in place today. And there's over 100 Aboriginal art centres now that are there for that mob on country for those people. So their storytelling is, is, is actively happening all the time. So their support is, is themselves. They are supporting themselves by passing down their stories. So that's a very different thing to what we're talking about. In, we, I can't speak on Kylie's behalf and Kylie has to speak on her own, as do other well, urban artists. Kylie Gary in particular, um, are we neglecting urban Indigenous people in that case? to make that connection and continue with artists. Kylie? Well, not so much. I think there's a huge place for urban Aboriginal artists as well. And you see, like, you know, there's been Aboriginal artists that had their artwork featured on the block, you know, primetime mm, TV mm. shows and things like that. And it's not necessarily traditional art or desert art mm. or from art centres. It's urban artists that are located in Melbourne or wherever it might be that they're doing that. So I think that, yeah, there there is a, um, a huge space for it. I think on a tourist point of view, when tourists come to Australia, they're looking for that traditional style of art. And unfortunately, sometimes they may end up with art that wasn't even created in that's Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, made in China yeah. or whatever yeah. it might be. Horrible. But that's the idea from a world point of, point mm. of view, I think mm. that, yeah. So maybe it's a way of pushing more urban art styles in a, in a, in a larger global scale, maybe, I don't know. But yeah, I, I, I think Things like this and discussions and groups and um, art exhibitions that we hold as local urban artists and um, stuff like that helps to create that profile and, and keep that out of line and supporting one another and, you know, collecting each other's art and things like that. I've got my walls filled with local artists and stuff like that. So, yeah, just, I, I don't know, I think that there is a market for it and there is a huge space for it in um, urban Australia or you know, not so much remote area of Australia. Uh, now, Jody, you brought a book along mm -hmm. and you've got some stats you wanted mm -hmm. to tell us, yeah? Now, admittedly, mm. these were about six years old, but there's still very interesting statistics. The quote is, Aboriginal Australians constitute about 2.5% of the population or roughly 400,000 people, yet they account for as much as 70% of the nation's total art sales, according to art investment firm Art Equity. This is all the more remarkable given there are only an estimated 5,000 to 6,000 practicing Aboriginal artists, the bulk of them living in small communities on their traditional tribal lands in the central deserts and tropical north. Few, if any of them, are art school trained. Now, 70% of the nation's total art sales, if Coming that, if that doesn't need support, I don't know yeah. what does. <laughs> five to 6,000 people, mostly living mm -hmm. in remote areas, mm -hmm. untrained. Aside from our. <laughs> yes, um, doing, what was the figure, 70 to 80%? 70% of the nation's art sales. That's for overseas primarily or for um, tourists both. coming here? That's, no, well both, just art sales, art sales of, you know. of Australian, Australian right. art, so 70%. Clearly it's a major industry in this country. It is a major country. industry and, it, and it's uh, not necessarily buoyant um, because the first generations of artists doing traditional artwork were given um, quite um, uh, prestige in the art museum and market international world. Mm -hmm. And because the way that Aboriginal people paint in a, con in a traditional sense of it pa being passed down, grandma's work that might have received acclaim and be hanging in, in international galleries and have um, garnered very high sales, granddaughter isn't getting a tenth of that because it's seen as being a replication mm. of something that's already seen. So that's a very, very important um, cog in the wheel of what's going on in Aboriginal art, which is, you know, basically what so, we're... So does that mean um, uh, what you guys are doing, which is updating it, trying new mm. things, mm. Uh, getting away from the traditional, uh, people will see it as a new version, a new art, not just um, rehashing an old form. Mm in European yeah, eyes. Yeah, so mm. definitely. There's a new movement of Aboriginal artists, you know, right across Australia in different areas. Um, like we were talking about the different colours or painting on different um, things, even on porcelain, on, you know, bags or canvases. I even saw a guy once set up at the markets with um, suitcases that were painted and they looked amazing. So yeah, just different, I guess, forms or different ways of expressing that art as well as, yeah, different 
styles and um, types of art as well. And, and the mediums yeah. you're, you're, yeah. you're yeah. doing, yeah. bags and shoes yeah, and clothes, so yeah. it can yeah. be transferred into um, oh. other mediums yeah. to keep the whole industry Doesn't buoyant yeah. rather than sort of you know, sliding. So that seventy percent is not just paintings; no. it's all forms. forms of it art. probably includes digital. Well, in, in this yeah. in this quote, it was to do with with art per se. But if it's declining in sales for any number of reasons, and that that's just one of them, with with regard to the second and third generations not being seen in an economic sense as being as valuable as, then there has to be another area within Aboriginal art to sort of you know continue the the economy mm. of Aboriginal art for all Aboriginal people who choose to be artists. Gary, as an urban artist, um, how did you sort of find support? Are you, are you talking about your experience as a young black boy before? Mm. Um, how did you turn that around and make that um, an, a positive choice for yourself to become an artist? Mm. Did you find support? Was there? Yeah, well, I, can't, well, my, I was adopted at a young age, so I never grew up around Kempsey. With that, I, I ended up growing up around La Perouse in Sydney, uh, in amongst the digital people. But um, in amongst them, they had there's a long line of creative people there. That's uh, my great uncle Joe actually went to France and was a world champion boomerang thrower, and he threw one off the top of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> you know, so, and um, you know, th so they've always pushed me for a long, long time. So, to they, I used to, always used to draw with a you know pencil and paper, and nothing. So again, like, it's from family. Yeah, mainly. Just, they've always been pushing me, but I go, oh, you know, I don't want to do that, this, that, the other. But then one day it just occurred. Mm. Yeah. Well, Ron, you're, you're one that's actually, uh, you're passing this on yourself. So you're, you're teaching young people this as a kind of mentor, yes. I, I suppose. Yes. Yes. Do you feel that work is valuable and important? I presume you Oh, would. yeah, <laughs> it's exceptionally important. And it's also good for the young children too, because it allows you, it's surprising how sitting there going dot, 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 how relaxing that is, how much <laughs> it changes your mind. It makes you some more mellow, you, and it teaches the kids, kids to uh, appreciate the art itself as well. You know, and they understand a little bit more about we as a race as well. You know, instead of being stuck here going, Aboriginals, Australia first was born here in whenever Cook arrived or such, you know, and all these type of things. We're teaching them other things as well yeah. about this country and how great it is. So we're teaching them the history that they haven't otherwise learned of, well, of their own people. Well, Australia is well, right. well, always written it? by the winners. Mm. Mm -hmm. In any situation, yeah. history mm -hmm. is always written by the winners. Mm -hmm. But there's always another side to it. Yeah, and unfortunately, yeah. this time has taken you know, a long time yeah. for it to start. And is art and culture the best way to uh, revise that history? It's a, it's a starting point. Yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah. I think everything that we do as urban artists is educational. We're teaching people about our culture. It may not be yeah. like the kind of art that Jodie deals with necessarily, but we're teaching people through art about our history. And for us as Aboriginal people, it's also a healing tool. Like Ron's saying about, like it's like meditation or like you've overcome a lot of things in your life, Gary. It's a healing tool. That, yeah, it is that self-expression, but it's, it's a connection to culture and country that other people can't ever really mm. understand. Mm. One, one of the things I found, and this only just occurred to me now, any of you see there was a TV series called Black Comedy? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> Which was this then? very funny. <laughs> Sorry, but as as a non-indigenous person, it was very insightful to to see you represent yourselves that way. That oh, you've got a sense of humour, and we can do that, and you can, you know make fun of us and yourselves and it works both ways definitely and that's the way we've overcome everything sense invasion is um, humor in our families in our own life like outside before we got us to be quietened down a little bit we're all sitting out there giggling that's the way as a community we deal with things we share and we laugh we talk we giggle and you know even the most hurtful things we laugh it mm. off like and that's that's part of our healing process our so humor there, there's Two tangents I want to take you. The first is which we started with was um, teaching young people about their culture and the history and teaching them the art through that. Uh, do you feel, Kylie, that's an important thing to do? Yeah, definitely, yeah. For not, not just our kids as well, and like I say, kids that may not be strong in their identity, but for the, the wider community as well and um, non-Aboriginal kids as well. Um, I think as Aboriginal people, we have a responsibility to do that and to share our culture and so that we don't have a generation of, you know, 
people that are ignorant or racist and you know like we're seeing a lot with the Adam Adam Good stuff in the media and stuff like that and people that just don't un understand and you know may not even realize that they're being racist with their comments on social mm. media and stuff like that so the things that we do in teaching art dance song all of those things they're they're tools that the young people may not even realize that they're learning something at mm. the time it's about having fun or expressing themselves or learning something different but they're very important tools to yeah grow from that and those were some of the funniest sketches yeah. in black comedy the, the <laughs> racism ones yes <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, do, 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 do you agree do you feel this is just as important oh, absolutely you know with my family at least you know if you couldn't laugh at yourself don't laugh at anyone else that's mm. the way we grow up yeah you know that's just how it was but you know there is a lot of hurt underneath that too mm. but um you know, you've got to take the first step somehow. And uh, if by masking it with, with humour, that, that's the way we sort of did it. You know, but... Um, There's yeah. a history of, yes, of fantastic um, Aboriginal comedic film. You can go back into the 80s, the, the mm. stuff that Gary Foley did. There's yeah. some very, yes, yeah. very extremely sophisticated, mm. witty Indigenous And you look back at Ten Canoes, for example, which was very funny, actually. Sure. Um, from your experience working with many different artists, um, uh, do you find that teaching people, teaching young people their culture through art and having that sense of humour, do you find that in um, the outback regions, for example? Bush mechanics. I mean, you know, one of the oh, funniest... Best show on TV. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the comedy in, in Aboriginal culture is as vibrant as in any other culture. Mm. Um, and art, historically, is the, the mirror to which culture... Um, reflects itself in all cultures from time immemorial. So the idea that Aboriginal uh, people wouldn't be encouraged to, to, to foster art is absurd to me. I mean, because art, art is, and, and all forms of art, the written word, film, all the rest of it, um, mm -hmm. and film is, is uh, becoming a very, very um, powerful tool for young Aboriginal boys and girls, men and women, mm. to tell story. And because it's a 21st century medium, um, they live in the 21st century, mm. they're watching television, they're watching films. I mean, aside from the great filmmakers, Aboriginal filmmakers, extraordinary filmmakers, um, the, the, the kids are using cameras a lot and making mm. short films in the same way that, that stories would be told in you know painting form. Indeed, but there's courses that I run here and I've had some Indigenous people, like currently at the moment we're running one and even last year, and they were telling those stories yeah. through documentaries that we were filming. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me ask the hard question. How can we, how can you as Indigenous people, Indigenous Australians, help educate us, the European invaders, you know, of your culture and to help that, I hate the word, but that reconciliation I just, oh, personally, I think but to continue what we're doing, always, you know, if you hear something that may not be correct, then, you know, try and educate that person, talk about that issue or whatever it might be. If someone's being racist, you know, address it. If someone's telling someone to rack off out of this country because you don't belong here or whatever, <laughs> you know, like, uh, try and talk to that and address it, you know. I, I think, and continuing what we do with the young people in schools, workshops, going to business places, like... I've done a lot of cultural awareness training in the past too in different business places and in my previous workplace. Um, things like that, just sharing that culture, sharing stories from our own family and your own history because we're all so diverse in our Aboriginality as mm. well. So just I think a lot of us don't understand how, how diverse yeah, it is. Yeah, extremely yes. diverse, yeah. Is it, however, the job of Indigenous people to educate non-Indigenous people? Well, Surely... Yes. As, as a culture who has come in and taken over another culture and the dominant culture who is in government and charge and is in charge of education systems and television and the media and whatever, is, is it really fair? Well, this is why that I don't like the, the word indigenous communities' responsibility to yeah. teach. You don't have to reconcile with us. We have to reconcile yeah. with you. Absolutely. You know, and that, you're quite right. The government should take that view, I think, well, rather than. We as individuals. Should well, yes, taking that view, yeah. therefore mm. pushing the government and other bodies to represent us to, to want to take an active role in that way. So help us. What can you? What can we do to help this process? Well, I think the, uh, most of it comes from just a lack of awareness. Like mm. as I say, like what I said, with the history was written by the winners. Like most people that you speak to, the stuff they've learned in school, they don't know the other half of it. Like mm -hmm. they know Captain Cook landed here. Mm. They know all you know about the first fleet and that. 
What about the people that were on the beach at the time? Mm. Mm. What about them? What are their names? Yeah. You know, yeah. mm. it's, it's, it's just awareness of the other side of the coin. Mm. There's two sides to it, and there's just a, absolutely no knowledge of, of our side of it. You know, the, that's the whole thing with Australia Day and that, you know, they Invasion celebrate Day. that, but yeah. look at the other yeah. side of the coin. That's it. It's some, awesome. if someone knocked on your front door and rocked in and said, this is my house now, you're not going to really be happy about that. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that need to be addressed, like the National Anthem, like Gary says Australia Day, lots of different things that don't necessarily represent us, where you see other countries around the world, like New Zealand, they have the Māori anthem and then, you know, English anthem and a lot of the name places of library, toilets, whatever, has the Māori, you know, language first and then the English language. We're not seeing those sorts of things. But in we the Constitution moved, itself. Moved that forward. And the they, Constitution. They are recognised. It's a massive debate, that's, that's that's a massive debate for yeah. us. And this was one of the topics brought up by one of those um, subjects in the documentary that I mentioned earlier, that, you know, they have a treaty and they solved this some years ago yes. and their culture is built around that. Yeah. Uh, mm. Uh, as a multicultural society. Mm. Um, as much as we claim Australia is a multicultural society, we're talking about the other cultures that are here, all the European cultures That's that are right, here, and Asian yeah. cultures now. Well, see, I was lucky when we were coming back to when, when I was talking about the Yothi Yindi CD. I had a fairly good education, I think. Um, and, and I was shocked when I had the opportunity to be in and around Aboriginal activists that I didn't know anything that they were talking about. I said, what racism? What, what issues in health? What, what disparity? What are you talking about? It was a shock to me and I thought I was a fairly aware person mm. in my early 20s. And so I had that opportunity to, to um, take on my art studies, the, the music that I was interested in, which was extraordinary music, and, and start to say, well, I, I should know. I, I'm an I'm a educated Australian, and I should know about everybody in my community, and I don't know about Aboriginal people. W what's wrong with that? So, I mean, we're digressing a little bit from, from art, but the, the, the cornerstones of of awareness is based in our education system. Mm. Well, and this it's, is it's severely lacking. I presume why you began the gallery. I, I, I did want to, and still do, use it as an opportunity to engage people who want to ask questions about Aboriginal people. Now, I'm no, no um, specialist in the area, but I have certainly had a lot more experience with Aboriginal communities than a lot of non-Indigenous people do. And I found that there was no other platform for people to have a, rather than watching an in-depth documentary, quite shocking, or or studying at university, or there didn't seem to be a way for people to ask what might be terribly inappropriate questions, um, or really quite, um, you know, questions so fundamental it was ridiculous. They didn't know who to ask. And because I'm a white fella, mm. other white fellas could come in and say, look, you know Aboriginal people, don't you? And I'd say, yeah, a few. Um, can you t I've always wanted to know and engage an open discussion, and I've had some very <laughs> robust discussions. To ask those silly questions and actually start educating themselves. They do, they, people want yeah. to know, but they don't know where to go. Well, they're too to embarrassed the to ask because, yes. That's right, yeah. that's right. Well, they're and embarrassed and that, that a lot of the information has been suppressed. Mm. You know, it's, yeah. it's 200 years of not telling anybody anything. It's, been, yeah. it's all been hidden. Mm. You know? And I might suggest still not being That's told. Right. I mean, you know, if you want to find out about Aboriginal history, you need a shovel to dig it up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's, that's the truth of it. So where, where do we start with that? Um, uh, teaching that in school, in primary school? Uh, Absolutely. Through people Just, like uh, yourselves coming in? It, it needs to start right at the very beginning. And they need to learn the other side. Mm. From the very but This medium stage. that we're using at the moment, we should have more voice in that as well. Mm. Well, know, I would like to see more Aboriginals on TV and such things, yeah. you know, because mm. I did read an article once where there was a survey put out where I think it was 97% of Australians didn't like to see Aboriginals on TV. They found it embarrassing. Didn't like to see them? No. Let's think didn't. that, I hope that's a very old survey. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm. It was a very old survey, but it was quite a while ago. But I was, I was shocked. I thought to myself, wow, you know. Well, TV generally doesn't represent the multiculturalism of Australia. No. No. In, in, any, but in, in any sense. No, no, it doesn't. It's, it's, no. It doesn't no, we, no. We, they were still speak of the Queen's English up until you know, not all that mm. long ago. You weren't mm. even allowed to use an Australian accent. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, 
I'm going to have to leave it here because we've been we'll be going all night otherwise. <clears throat> and I do want to get to our local legend package, which is um, Raymond de Blanco. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, before we wrap it up, if you have anything to spook or talk about, uh, Jody, where's your website, for example? Where can we find you? The gallery. And we're in Kilcare, and we'd love anyone to come down and see the incredible art that we have, range of beautiful, very, very bright art, mainly from the Central Desert, but from a lot of other areas as well, and ask as many questions as they would like. As many awkward and embarrassing questions anything, as they can. Anything, anything. I'll, I'll help <laughs> navigate the answer where best I can. Kylie, where can we find you and your um, work? Um, oh, just Kylie Cassidy on Facebook at the moment. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, just a local Central Coast girl. Most people will, I guess, if you get in contact with somebody, will know me. But yeah, Facebook is the main outlet that I've been using at the moment. So just okay, Kylie Google Cassidy. you and find you on yeah. Facebook. <laughs> Ron. How about yourself? Do you have any kind of online presence or something you want to talk about? I've got a phone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we should give out the phone number though. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> as far as it goes. Yeah. I... <laughs> so what, what schools do you tend to um, uh, mentor at? Well, I've done a few around here. I just did the library, not so, uh, the Gosford Library. I yeah. had to help. They did a art class on there. They brought some kids and that in. But I don't like technology too much. I'm just an old backward man. Oh, well, keep yeah. an eye out for when he's at the library next door or in your local school, I guess. People could contact Ron through Kylie or me. Yes. <laughs> when in doubt, go to the gallery yeah, and yeah. we'll track you down. But there is something that we will say. In the coming up, there's having a reconciliation when they have their exhibition. Mm -hmm. We as a group are putting in an exhibition to run in conjunction with that. Mm -hmm. So if anyone would like to come along and see that. Where's that at? At Gosford Gallery. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yes. Do we know next when? Next year in May. May. Okay. Don't have the week. Day. Don't have the reconciliation week. week. Yeah. From the 26th of May yes. onwards. Okay. Keep put in your diary. Yeah. 26th of May next year, 2016. Uh, Gary, where can we find you online? Uh, for me, it's uh, on Facebook as well. Uh, it's uh, Facebook Dream One Abor Aboriginal Arts, or myself, my name, Gary Purchase, and you'll see it pop up there. That's mainly where I do my things. Or Dream One Aboriginal Arts dot com dot au is a website that I have. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you very much Thank for being you. our panel. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And also, just before we wrap up, I want to thank Bobby Murray, who is our consulting producer for this episode, helped us find our guests and get, our, get everything organised for this episode. We have another song coming up from Jamie Smith, but before we get to that, we have our local legend interview. This is with Raymond de Blanco, who is the cultural and dance coordinator at NASDA. Um, Naysda, I should give you the full title, Naysda Dance College. So, Raymond de Blanco. to the Indigenous episode of The Litmus Test. This is Tina A. Wake. I'm here today at NASDA with beautiful choreographer and dancer, Raymond Blanco. So what is your heritage? Um, I'm Pajika Wick on my Aboriginal side, um, which is right at the tip of Cape York, up near Bamaga and Ingenue there. Um, that's where the Aboriginal side of the family comes from, and that's through my father's side. As well from my father's side, I'm, I'm Magrem from Murray Island, Mayor, and on my mother's side, I'm Darnley Island, Erub and Malay. Wow. Yeah, so it's all a bit of a, a fruit salad. A fruit salad. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. With beautiful black curly hair, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> what drew you into dance? Ah, oh, hard to say really. I, I, you know, you just know. You just know when, like I, I remember when I got kicked out of high school, I, um, I think I had about 15 jobs in six months. And I just kept popping around, going from one to the other. Uh, one of the, the classic ones was I went for a, an apprenticeship as a painter. And the guy says, so you like, why do, why do you want this job? And I said, because I like to paint. <laughs> Not necessarily houses, but you know. <laughs> Uh, and so then I realised, hang on, maybe there's something about the arts or something. And then, like, all through my youth, I was, I was just dancing and family gatherings and everything. And where was Raymond? He was dancing. Um, so, yeah, it sort of was a natural avenue. As soon as I heard 
that um, Sylvia, my cousin, Sylvia Blanco, was dancing in Sydney. I, well, that was it. I was going to Sydney. There was no question about it. And it's taken you all around the world, the dancing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, my fantasy now is to actually travel the world without a dance company. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just be a tourist, you mean? Yeah, just be a tourist. You know, uh, well, as much as we've we've done South America, we've done Europe, we've done America, we did every pretty pretty much continent on on, on the planet. Um, you're always with your dance company, and you're always off the plane, on a bus, to the hotel, to the theatre, back to the hotel, on the plane, back, or on to the next place you were going to. Um, and, and it went on for years and years and years. And, and there was a year, I think it was about 1995, 96, where AIDT, the company, was the most toured dance company in Australia. How does dance connect you to your land and your heritage? <laughs> I've never, ever, ever been asked this question. How does it connect me? Through your feet? <laughs> through my spirit. Yeah. It's through, yeah, yeah, you say through, but it, that is, you're right, it is through your feet, you connect to the earth, you connect, you know. I believe that we're all made of the same thing. I'm one of those believers that, you know, all of our particles and cells and shit, and it's all the same as the trees and the wind and the grass and the earth, and we need to wake that up and, and really connect. That's the connection. That's, and if you really feel that, that feeds your spirit. And if you're on the right path, you will know. Because something will push you towards the right path. Otherwise, it's just, you, you can't ignore. That's why I say you cannot ignore. You try and fight it and you'll lose. Reconnecting with your heritage is so important. It, is, it helps solidify you. Um, you know, here I, at the moment I teach Aboriginal studies here for the younger, the first years that come through it's because we get so many different um, backgrounds of people that some have like found out in the last three years that they're Aboriginal and you know others come from a remote community or people have grown up with the culture so you're getting all of this, you're getting white skinned blackfellas, you know, who are really paranoid about, oh, I, um, stolen generation, you know, and, well, and so you're trying to give them this sense of belonging and ownership of their culture. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's a difficult thing for them to do. And if that and the, there are more and more and more people discovering this and the more we can actually allow them to accept, you know, yeah, you've got Aboriginal, but you've also got your Irish and you've also got that and that makes you who you are, you know. If you identify as Aboriginal, we can help you further. You know, um, I always identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander with Spanish and Malay background. You know, that's part of who I am. Yeah. You know, that's part of who they are. If they, if, you know, whatever, whatever the, their heritage is, it's, yeah. it's all part of that fruit salad we were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the end of our special episode on Indigenous art. I'd like to thank all of our panel, and I'd also like to, la to thank Kylie Cassidy, who provided the paintings, the shoes, the bags, um, and the bush food that we had on set there. Um, if you want to follow us, you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, our website is thelitmustest.com, with dashes in between the words. Uh, our next episode next month is all about literature and poetry. Don't miss that one. It'll be our final episode, in fact, for this season. Uh, but to take us out, Another song from Jamie Smith. Take it away, Jamie. When you're traveling down that highway Trying to find your way back home Just remember I'm there with you You will never be alone Follow the signs in the landscape Follow the carvings in the trees They will bring you home safely Back to where you ought to be It was a long time ago 
when you set out on your own left the family back home trying to make it on your own but things got hard and it was tough many a places it was rough but you came through it all be a man standing tall so when you're traveling down that highway trying to find your way back home just remember i'm there with you you will never be alone Follow the signs in the landscape Follow the carvings in the trees They will bring you home safely Back to where you ought to be Many years have passed us by Many times I sat and cried Think about loved ones back home Yes, it's hard being alone But friends you meet along the way Make it easier to stay but now it's time to come on home Be with your family once more So when you're traveling down that highway Trying to find your way back home Just remember I'm there with you you will never be alone Follow the signs in the landscapes Follow the carvings in the trees They will bring you home safely Back to where you ought to be Yeah, back home again!